Hi, everybody. Sorry, this is Nick Lund from Maine Audubon of Bird Safe Maine. I forgot to hit record at the beginning. We're kind of jumping in in the middle. Uh, bird strikes are a big problem. We'll get to the volunteer piece in, this, in a minute. Um, this is my, uh, this is Professor Marr from, uh, from or Mayor Marr. I'm sorry, Mayor, I was pronouncing Mayor, it. it's okay. Mayor, I always do that incorrectly. Professor Mayor from USM, uh, a founding partner in Bird Safe Maine, uh, and she's going through um, what we find in the spring in the city of Portland. Okay, cool. And all right, so that's showing you just like I said, sort of a, a timing of the of the finds. Um, but this is actually um, how many birds we're finding across the seasons. And there's a few things going on in these slides. So this depicts our, our five seasons where we have found birds. And the first thing that might stand out to you is that fall is pretty busy. Um, we definitely find a lot more birds in the fall than we do in the spring. And that probably has to do with a few factors not least of which is the fact that there are probably just more birds as you if you saw Nick's initial slide just showing you the number of birds that are migrating um, south is a lot more than migrating north and that's because you have all those babies that are um, hatched in the spring um, over the course of the season that are now moving southward and not all of them make it to go back north in the um, in the next year so we, we do find more um, but you can see that we have been finding birds in the spring and the fall, and we've also seen that we are um, increasing the number of birds that we are finding, even though our effort hasn't actually increased, especially between fall 21 and fall 22, but there's some other reasons that I can go into um, as to probably why we are seeing such a big increase, and this is also one of the reasons why we are excited um, and a little anxious perhaps about what we're gonna find this spring because of the pattern that we saw from fall 2022. Um, and um, not the crux of the matter is that there's a building in particular that has really come online now that we have access to. And there's another, there's a couple of buildings that are close to the waterfront that are, um, are open and we can get to because they've newly constructed. And we think that that's sort of driving this increase. What you also see is that the majority of the birds that we find are dead. Um, probably a little over half of the birds that we find um, are, are not alive. But then we do find about maybe 40% of the birds are stunned. So they have hit the window um, and they're often just sitting there motionless. You can you can tell that the bird is is stunned and, and not quite with it. And what we can do is, as Nick's slide showed before, you can call Avian Haven and, and um, we can have some rehabilitators take care of them. Many times what we do is we just move the bird to a safe place um, under some cover of bushes. Um, it may make recover, it may not. Um, it depends on the extent of its injuries. A lot of the times you just can't tell because they're internal injuries and are pretty traumatic. Um, the other category of birds that we find though too are strikes. And this is when, and this is just being in the right place at the right time, a bird just hits the window and then pretty much just bounces off. And, and those can be hard to identify because the birds hit real quickly and then fly away. So they're a challenge, but we do see a, um, a fair number of birds that just strike um, as well. All right, so that's sort of some of the overall patterns. Um, Nick alluded to the birds that we find. Um, we find birds from many different families. Not all of them are songbirds, but the vast majority of these birds that strike are songbirds. And you can see in particular that the, the most vulnerable birds are the New World sparrows and the warblers. And again, that's not surprising um, because of the, the birds that migrate through Portland um, during the fall and the spring. And Nick, feel free to jump in with um, your bird expert hat on here too for, um, for talking about any of that too. Um, thrushes are another big one. Um, we find quite a few uh, the hermit thrushes. Um, we found Swainson's, um, some other thrushes in there too, as well as, um, yeah, those are some of the predominant birds. Uh, yeah, I'd say it's, par it's partly because, you know, we have 20 or so different warblers that come through Maine and, you know, 10 or so different sparrow species. So um, there, it's sort of a stacked deck a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, often it's um, sparrows and warblers, but, but we found everything from large woodpeckers to woodcocks to um, all kinds of other things. Yes, thank you. All right, so let's if we let's go in. We can dive down a little bit deeper and look at these two families in particular um, of the warblers that we find. Um, common yellow throats are by far the most common, no pun intended. And um, oven birds are kind of a um, a distant second, but those are particularly vulnerable. And and if you're, that's not too surprising given the habits of common yellow throats. They like to be down low, kind of hanging around in bushes and things like that. And so when um, then they take off, 
they'll are, are more prone to to running into the glass buildings when they um uh when if they're trying to just look for food or avoid a predator or something like that. Um, so common yellow throat is by far the most abundant. And then amongst the um, sparrows, it's the white-throated sparrows. Um, again, sparrows in general tend to like to be down on the ground, um, hopping around looking for food and um, are particularly vulnerable to glass strikes. So we find a lot of white-throated sparrows. They're, I think, the most common bird overall that we find. Um, as, and again, swamp sparrow is a distant um, second, and then we have these unknowns. You see a lot of those are strikes because they hit, they bounce, and then they fly away. And sparrows can be difficult enough to identify, especially when they're in flight. So um, so that's a one thing that we found there. And then in terms of location, so this is another big important piece of the data that we collect, not just what species we're finding, but where we find them. And um, so these are some, uh, we found birds at something like 67 different locations along our route. And Nick's gonna show you what that route is in a few minutes. Um, again, fall accounts for the bulk of these, but, but we do find them significant number in the spring. And actually, if you boil it down, there are six buildings in Portland that are responsible for about two thirds of all of the collisions that we find along our survey route. Um, and these are the addresses. And Nick, I don't know, do I have time to kind of narrow down and show them our top three? Is that okay if I do? Yeah, if you want to, sure. Okay, so so our top three bird um, buildings that where we find these birds. So we'll start with number three in third place. Um, is this building on Thames Street. It doesn't actually have an address yet, um, but it's a brand new building. Um, it's across from the um, Narrow Gauge Railroad. You may be familiar with it. Um, and this is the one that came online really in the fall of 2022. And we are finding a considerable number of birds there. And for some of the reasons that Nick alluded to before, it's, it's close to the water. So birds, if they're following the shoreline along their migration path, if they're using that as a route, things like that, then and then they drop down and they rest and they drop down into this lovely habitat that's right adjacent to the building. Um, if they're flying over at night and then they're going to rest during the day. And so there's good habitat. And then there's a lot of glass right nearby too. So those three factors are probably contributing to why we find so many birds there. Um, in second place, we have this building, which is located on Commercial Street, but it sits back from Commercial Street a little ways. Um, by separated by a parking lot, but it has some of the same attributes. There's really nice habitat. Some of the largest trees, I think, in the old port are sitting right here. Um, and there's a, an alleyway that, that separates um, a parking garage from this building um, where those trees are. And so birds can come in there that, and see that great habitat. And then when they take off, they just hit the windows because there's a lot of glass. And those windows, as you can see here, reflect the habitat. Um, right around there. So um, about um, one in five birds that we find strike here. And then um, the biggest culprit where we find a quarter of the birds are at this building, which is right in the corner of um, Hancock Street and Thames Street across from Ocean Terminal. Again, right against the water, there's a lovely courtyard in the back that traps birds, again, because of the shape of that. There's nice habitat adjacent to it, and just like I said, a, a fair amount of glass. So those are sort of the places that we have found um, the most birds um, to date. And it'll be interesting to see how things shape up again this year. And I'll stop sharing, um, in part because we do have some new buildings um, that are in that same general area that um, we'll be monitoring for sure this year. So, okay. Thanks, Chris. That was awesome. And I, I will say before folks ask, we are in contact with the owners of all those buildings um, uh, uh, and they are aware of um, the problem. The, uh, the trouble is it's, it can be very difficult to retrofit a building. Um, it can be extremely expensive. It can be technically difficult to get up and, and treat areas. Um, and there's no requirement right now for anybody to do anything. And so even well-meaning uh, business owners um, even if they wanted to, you know, take action, it can be very expensive and hard. And so we're not trying to sort of shame building owners, especially ones that are already uh, existing. We are working with them and are happy to help them um, take action where they can. Um, but we're, we are trying to, this is a scientific effort to try to learn about this, especially to uh, get or an ordinance passed that will take care of this in the future. So we don't have new giant glass buildings coming up. But we are working with those buildings and others on, uh, on potential treatments. Okay, so I'm going to jump in now 
And uh, let me say too, that if folks have questions, you can put them in down in the Q&A box um, at the bottom and we will get to them at the end. Um, but we're gonna try to power through some of the um, stuff about what it takes to be a volunteer here. And I forgot how to share my screen. Let me do that again. Here we are, you see that again? Here's the route. And what we are trying to do is walk a, um, a diverse route through the city. You know, so when we started this work, it was really about, hey, does the science that we've learned in other parts of the country, does it also apply to Portland? Which means two things, are birds hitting in Portland? And are they hitting more often against buildings with more glass than, than non-buildings? So we designed this route to take us by both. It takes us by buildings that have a lot of glass, but also some of the more you know, older or different buildings in Portland that don't have as much glass. If you think about the old port, think about a lot of sort of smaller windows with a lot of brick. Those are buildings that are not particularly, you know, jump out as being dangerous to birds. But we wanted to see if that bore, bore out uh, in practice. Uh, and after two and a half years, we can say unequivocally that yes, birds are striking against the city of Portland and they are striking against buildings that have more glass more often than they are with other buildings. So this is the route, it's slightly modified from, you know, we, we, we sort of tinker with it a little bit each season, but it's basically been the same throughout. We start down here. Can you see my cursor, Chris? Okay, start down here at Ocean Gateway. Um, this is just kind of a nice place to park. There's plenty of places to park down here. Um, and we do find um, birds against the entrance to the ferry terminal there. We start, there and we go across the street um, to um, the Wex building. This is the building that Chris identified as being um, the one that has seen the most strikes in the city so far. We typically start there, we walk down the street. This is part of the new development. This is that number three most dangerous building, the Sun Life building down here. We walk up, we go down Forest Street, we walk up Middle Street, go all the way down here to um, the TD Bank building up to one city center, up to this workout anytime building, which has seen a lot of strikes before. It's a 24 hour gym um, with a lot of glass. Walk down to the Cross Insurance Arena, walk back down to Commercial Street, um, up for some buildings here on 4th Street and then back. That's the route. Um, it takes about, it's, a, it's about two miles. Um, it takes about an hour, is that right, Chris? So? Been a while since yeah, it just so, depends on how many birds we find. But yeah, true. you can usually do it in about an hour. So all, so the way it works is that you um, ideally you meet up with uh, a buddy or another volunteer in the morning, um, and then you walk the route looking for birds. Um, you may find some, you may not find some. Uh, when you're done, when you find one, you have a couple options. You can um, you take a picture. Um, pictures are very important to this process. And I'll actually go into um, the pictures a little bit more. We use the pictures as our advocacy. I mean, pictures of birds on the street, um, it's very sad, but it's, but it's um, very helpful um, talking with business owners, talking with folks um, to say, look at this, look at the face of this problem. It's undeniable there. That bird strikes can be an easy problem to overlook unless you're sort of confronted with it. Um, so we ask folks to take pictures of birds. And then if the bird is dead, um, you can, th the best thing to do is just move it to an out of the way place. Um, in the past, we've worked with USM students who've collected birds for, for study. Um, we don't uh, have that right now and we don't need the carcasses of the birds. Um, it's probably best to let nature take its current course with, with the insects and things and just move the bird out of the way if you feel okay doing that. You can collect them if you'd like, uh, but, um, but that's not required. Um, for, for injured birds, um, it gets a little trickier. Um, as Chris said, there, there is very little that rehabil rehabilitators can do to help birds that, uh, ha, uh, that have struck. These are small birds with internal injuries, typically, and that's just a difficult thing to fix. However, we do have a partnership with Avian Haven, and you are welcome to um, collect a bird if you want and call Avian Haven to see if there's something they can do. Otherwise, what we often do is if you are able to, to catch the bird, and, and often you can, um, you can just place it out of the way. You know, a lot of times birds are sitting right on the sidewalk where they are, uh, you know, susceptible to gull predation or to getting stepped on by commuters. So if you can just move the bird to a place where it can recover a bush or a tree or somewhere out of the way, that's giving it the best chance that we can give it. And, and we'll see what happens there. But here's the route. This is how that works. Um, and let, 
let me see. Actually, I'll come back to those. Well, let's we'll do the photos. So, oh, real quick. So, yeah. Marcia asked if the buildings are color coded on the map. Yeah, the the buildings here are co are color coded to. They used to be numbered, but our intern, our uh, our GBCOG fellow Katie did this sort of rainbow uh, thing now. And so, yes, uh, purple is Ocean Gateway. And then uh, it, it goes around the chromatic scale from there all the way back uh, to purple. Um, we have uh, Greater Portland Council of Governments um, uh, through AmeriCorps has given us a fellow this year, uh, a wonderful uh, young woman named Katie, who is actually up presenting on this work uh, somewhere in the mid coast to the AmeriCorps crew right now, so she can't join us. Um, but she um, put together this really helpful route map um, and I will have these, um, I, I will email this around to folks for a map, but I also will have them during the group walk on the 18th. Um, I'll talk about the group walk a little bit more in detail in a second, but every kickoff day for this work, we all get together and, and we get everybody to walk the route together. Um, it's really helpful to sort of figuring out what the route is, to, to talk about where to look. And so um, I, uh, I'll do it again at the end, but I want to encourage everyone to join us on April 18th at six in the morning. I'm going to get that out there right now. This is early work, six in the morning at Ocean Gateway, and we'll all walk together. And uh, it's a lot of fun and really educational. And that's a late start. <laughs> but, I won't, that. but I won't scare everybody away. Just Talk yet. about that later. All right. Sorry. Um, Katie also put together these great um, photo slides, and this is something that um, is really helpful because getting getting good photos um, is really helpful to our advocacy effort. Um, so Katie put together these slides: clear, identifiable, and evocative is the is what we're looking for. Um, photos like this are not super identifiable. Um, I can't tell what bird species that is. I'm going to guess white-throated sparrow, um, but um, um, that's helpful to see the glass that it's struck on, but not super helpful to help us understand what type of bird it is. A photo like this, you know, shows you that this is a living creature, was a living creature, this common yellow throat. Um, it is a very uh, evocative and clear and identifiable photo. As is one like this, this is um, uh, a, the, the Colin Bergs again um, uh, with a common yellow throat showing the building and um, evocative photo. Um, Blurry photos or uh, difficult lighting, this can be hard, are, are not as helpful. Um, this is a Lincoln Sparrow, I can tell, but you know, um, because uh, of the lighting conditions here, this isn't a photo that we'd be sort of be able to use in, a, in an advocacy context. Um, others are, um, here are some clear photos of, uh, in this case, a black pole warbler and another common yellow throat. And again, two swamp sparrows showing you some sort of good and bad photos. So if you feel comfortable, you know, channel your inner advocate, channel your inner photojournalist, get right down on the ground, um, take a clear photo. It really helps a lot um, uh, with the back end. And so how does it work? This is how you walk around. Um, you start, uh, especially early on, it's at six in the morning. So the biggest challenge for everyone in this work, myself included, is getting up in the morning and getting out there. I will say once you are once you are out there, and especially once you're done, it's seven in the morning. You've walked a couple of miles. You feel great about yourself. You've seen the city in a different way. Um, you can get some coffee, and you don't have to worry about eating that uh, croissant because you've just been walking around. So it does feel great for the rest of the day once you do it. Getting up uh, is 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 never any fun, but um, some people love it, and I encourage you to do it. Um, you so typically you start at Ocean Gateway. This is um, down there along Commercial Street. This is where we'll meet for the first time. I will say you don't need to start there. Um, we like to have at least two, two volunteers every morning. Sometimes we have more. Many mornings we have more. And when you have more, you could choose to walk, uh, start at a different part of the route. And um, we encourage volunteers to communicate with each other to see where everybody is starting. Um, the, the truth is, and something we've learned in the years of doing this, is that birds sometimes don't last very long on the sidewalk. Um, birds are gobbled, especially by gulls that come down and, and get a meal, but they're also rodents and, uh, and other things that eat birds. And so, and that's one of the reasons why we start so freaking early is because we correct. have to feed the gulls to the birds. Correct. Um, and so, but we found that if you, uh, so it can be, you know, if you're starting at Ocean Gateway, it may be an hour or so before you get to some places on Commercial Street. But if you start uh, at different places, and then you can stagger around and have a better chance of connecting with birds on the sidewalk. But we started traditionally at Ocean Gateway. 
bring the clothes you need. Um, I will have some Ziploc bags and paper bags to distribute if you want them. Um, um, otherwise, it's basically um, just standard walking and make sure to have your camera. Um, when you find a, a dead bird uh, or a live bird, take photos and then take note of the time, the building you are at, the address, um, the species, if possible, um, and any other notes you may have. And at the end of the day, you're going to send those uh, to me. That's what it looks like when you're done. When you're done, congratulate yourself for being a good person. This is real, this is real good work. I mean, this, this work is directly contributing to policy changes in city in, in Portland and around the state. And so you are helping. So thank you so much for, for doing it. Um, get some pastries and get some coffee. It's that's the best part. And then email the, the photos and the info to Chris and I. Um, we take them, we make sure the bird is identified correctly, and I, we slot them into our database uh, that we can use for, for advocacy later on. Um, all right, and then finally, we're going to begin on the 18th. Um, uh, 6 a.m. at Ocean Gateway. Um, I will share um, these two things as well. This is how it's going to work here. Um, we have an electronic waiver for folks to sign out. Um, this is just something that Maine Audubon has to do for our, our volunteers. Uh, and we also have this sign up sheet. So this is how this looks. Um, some of our, um, our core team here has already signed up for, for days, but you see I will share this around with everybody. You can pick the days that work for you. You can do as many days as you want or as few days as you want. Oh, totally up to you. Um, typically, people choose one morning a week. That's great if you can do that. If you can't do that, that's totally fine too. Um, but you'll see that there's spots for four different volunteers here. Um, we'll hopefully, we'll, we'll add them out. You can go with the group, or you can choose a different way to go. Um, and then what we ask folks to do is put their contact information into this other tab down here. That way, different volunteers can connect with each other as they're going out to see, you know, are, are you sick? Are you showing up? Or where are you going to start? Things like that. That's it. Yeah, and we generally ask that at least one person um, for that given day make contact with the other people just to coordinate and and uh, yeah, so everybody's on the same page. All right. Um, okay, so Chris, any, any other things to add before I jump into questions? No, nope, I will say we do as the sunrise gets earlier, we do start earlier as the as this um, spring goes on and it gets a little rough <laughs> um, as, as spring goes on and you have to get up a little bit earlier, um, maybe like each week, it, the time changes a little bit more. Uh, and again, that's where it's good to sort of coordinate with the other members of the of the team that day so that everybody agrees what time we're going to start. Thank you. Um, yeah, dive in. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the chat too. And there's a yep. couple, there's one question that I'll let you take, but um, yeah, Diane Davidson is still a contact for wounded birds, Marsha. Yes. And um, yeah, if there's four volunteers, usually what we do is we will um, do a two and two. So we pair up two people will walk in one direction, two people will walk in another direction. Sometimes the um, a pair may start at a different location um, along the route too. And so we'll, we talk about if we're gonna walk clockwise or counterclockwise. Yeah, and, and pairing up is important. You, you know, we have never had any kind of problems on the streets, um, but anything is possible on the streets. Um, walking in pairs uh, really does help that. Um, and we encourage folks to do only what they feel comfortable and safe doing. Um, again, we've never had any kind of issue with anybody on the streets, but um, but this is out in public um, and uh, and early in the morning. So um, do what you feel comfortable with, um, and uh, and that's and that's great. Um, let me answer a few more questions from the questions here. If we can't make it on the 18th, can we still join later? Absolutely. Um, um, what uh, I will send around the sign up sheet to all the interested volunteers, everyone who signed up for this, and pick a date and then just get in touch with the other volunteer doing it. I would encourage you to, to maybe sign up for a date um, um, that you know other people are already doing or that or that I'm doing, and that way you can uh, or Chris or any any people that way you connect with someone to make sure that you're you're going uh, around. So it doesn't have to be on the 18th. Stevens uh, about Merlin. Sure, Merlin is a very helpful bird identification tool that you could download on your phone. Um, you can just hold your phone out and it'll identify the bird for you. Um, 
Merlin is awesome for birders of all kinds, whether you're doing this or just birding. And so please download Merlin. I will say that we're, I'm not, don't worry too much about getting the identification right. Um, it can be really hard when these birds are, are injured or, 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 you know, it's dark out there. Um, that's something that Chris and I do really well and, um, and, and um, get a good photo. Uh, and then we can make sure that the identification is solid later. Um, so, um, but Merlin really helps in the moment. Sylvia asks, can you walk a half or two thirds of the route if you don't have time for the full route? That's interesting. Um, it, the walking the full route is preferred, but any slice helps. Um, and so what I would uh, um, make sure you just connect with the all other volunteers during those mornings. And um, so you can let them know, um, you know what your abilities are, but of course, um, anything that helps. Um, we can also, there's other options too, like staying put at one building. You know, we never know what we miss when we're not there. Um, and, you know, staying at a, one particular building to see how many strikes occur there um, is, a, is a strategy you could do, too, if you're, if you're limited on time. With all this info, be info uh, will be emailed from Joel. Yes, I will be emailing everything around, um, including links to the sign-up sheet, um, links to the route map, um, and, and, uh, and things like that. Uh, if you have any other questions at any time, please reach out to Chris and I. Um, um, yeah, Barry, Barry makes a good point that the, the shaming um, may help. Um, shaming buildings does help, absolutely. And, you know, it's a fine line between, you know, being standoffish um, and, um, you know, encouraging them to take action. Um, we have seen it work and, and buildings do want to do the right thing sometimes, sometimes not. Um, and then, um, you know, we don't ha have regulatory tools at this point to force buildings to do anything, um, but, we're, but we're working on it. Um, but maintaining a good relationship and not an antagonistic relationship with, with the design community is extremely important at this point as we're working to get agreement on an ordinance and, and get things through. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're doing our best um, there. And somebody did ask about the ordinance, um, kind of the timeline for that for the, with Portland. It is possible. Um, so we have a draft ordinance now. Um, we are working it together with the city of Portland. Um, we think they're going to be supportive of it. Um, we may be able to hold um, public events um, about the ordinance directly as soon as the end of this month. Um, those haven't been put on the schedule yet, but we are working on that. Um, we're, we're planning on having two sessions, one for the building and design community itself and one for the public at large. Then as soon as potentially May, we may be able to um, uh, have a vote in front of the city council. We have city council support. Um, uh, from the from the beginning here, um, and so uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, when that comes, I will be in emergency touch with everybody here <laughs> and others to encourage you to come out and support this ordinance. Um, and honestly, these images and the, the data that we collect um, gets us here. I mean, it, it gets us in the door uh, to say, "Look, it's what's 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 happening on the street." So that's really important. Um, let me see here. Uh, send the map. I will send the map. Um, have to drop off Davidson. That's it. Oh, um, yeah, no, somebody asked about another contact person at Haven. Oh, Haven. Silverman. I don't recognize that name. Anyone at anyone at Avian Haven um, can help, or can connect you with someone who can help. Um, you know, they do incredible work over there and are willing to come down at different hours to to get stuff. Um, but sometimes they may be out, sometimes they may be gone, and so um, I, I generally encourage people to call any number at Avian Haven that they can, whether it's Diane's number. Um, or the general number um, listed on their website. Um, Center for Wildlife is another one we work with. They're based down in York County um, and, uh, and they can help. Okay, oh, I that see. was a lot of talking I just did. Um, any other questions? This is great. This is good work and this is growing work. And if you volunteer with us, you know, you are joining um, something I think you can be really proud of, something that's, that's, that's making progress. And so I thank you all for coming, for your interest. Um, if you have questions about what you can do at your homes or what you can do at places that are not Portland, uh, feel free to reach out to. Um, I'm Captain just going to put our addresses in the chat again. Um, so you have them. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out to us. And Nick will be sending some more information. I will. I look forward to seeing you all on the 18th, if possible. Um, and if not, seeing you wherever we can. And thanks, everybody, for your help. Thanks, everybody, for, for attending. We look forward to seeing you on the route. Take care. Bye.